Traditional diets are all based on calorie restriction and that does not seem to work at all. The concept is always the same. You go into a caloric deficit, you start to lose some weight and then you gain it all back. It's not very healthy, it's miserable and it's not sustainable. And, and the reason is that as you cut back on, on your portions, as, you, as your food becomes very tiny and you go into this caloric deficit, the body becomes better at holding on to the calories or extracting the calories from your food. So it's driving down its metabolic rate to compensate. So you get to hold on to your fat deposits while being miserable. So obviously that's not a good solution. And um, even if you have a short-term success, usually it bounces back and also you're not eating very healthy because you're still eating the foods that are not very good for us. So what we do here in clinic is changing uh, a few parameters like food composition and then uh, timed eating as well. So when we're eating and by eating healthier foods, by eating good fats, by decreasing carbohydrates and by actually eating healthy proteins, you're actually going to become healthier. You're going to cut out a lot of foods that are really, really bad for us. And I talk in other videos about this. You're cutting out bad fats. So you should not be afraid of fats. You should be afraid of bad fats and the bad fats again just to summarize are these vegetable oils or seed oils we call them polyunsaturated vegetable oils or omega-6 fatty acids and they're your canola oil sunflower oil soybean oil grapeseed oil i mean these are all terrible for us they clog up the mitochondria they're at the root of diseases as we know them and they make you gain weight and they're in everything in every processed food they slap it in there because it's very cheap so it's one thing you know that's easy to put in in your cereal in your breads in your cookies all this stuff anyway we're cutting those out but we're eating healthy fats and you don't really have to count those you know don't go overboard but basically if you have good fats that's absolutely fine so that means butter avocado oil olive oil and coconut oil these are the four examples i always give they're very clean fats make sure they're 100 percent because sometimes olive oil gets you know, uh, mixed with, guess what? Soybean oil and canola oil, so you don't want that. Buy oils in glass bottles, that's in another video as well. Don't buy, buy any oil of fats and plastic, that is really bad. We gotta cut down our plastic exposure through, through food, that's actually very important. So anyway, healthy fats, of course, healthy proteins, and then we decrease our carbohydrate intake, specifically refined flours and of course, uh, refined sugars. And that's something we are just really becoming horrible at as a society. In the US today, the average intake in carbohydrates is 250 grams per day. And that's insane. That's way too much. So when we decrease it, and I'm not saying everyone needs to be on a ketogenic diet. That's kind of its own animal. And that's something that fits for some people and some patients I do put on that diet. But in general, as a guideline, 50 to 100 grams of carbohydrates a day is fine. And we're trying to decrease the intake again from the simple sugars and all that that needs to go. And I want to talk about all these steps on, on how to do it, what to avoid, you know, just to, so, so that it kind of makes, makes sense. But we're trying to cut out, you know, the uh, uh, simple carbohydrates, the sugars and all these things, but also decrease complex carbohydrates, like, you know, uh, breads and pasta. We want to kind of have less of that because as a society, again, we're eating way too much of this. This is a change that has not been good for our metabolism. Uh, our body does well once in a while to burn uh, uh, fats and run on a fat metabolism for a little bit, at least overnight as we're, as we're fasting. It's actually a very good thing and it's a very healthy thing. So anyway, healthy fats and protein are important. Then uh, time uh, restrictive eating or intermittent fasting. And that's just a period between your last meal of the day and your first meal of the day. And by extending that, simply by doing that, and there were several studies that showed this, this is really fascinating. I give you the same food, uh, you know, exactly same calories, same food, same everything. And if you eat that over, let's say, a 12 to 14 uh, hour period in the day, which many people do today, they will gain weight. If I give you the exact same food over a time-restricted period, like eight hours a day, first of all, portions are bigger, you feel better, you feel full, and you lose weight. I mean, a simple thing like that has a huge impact on your body. But we're going to talk about all these details right now. We're going to dive in, and uh, I'm sure it's going to make all sense. So in our dietary summary, the main point really is going to be that people keep their results over time. And that's very important. That means, you know, once you lose fat and um, your weight comes down and you're getting healthier, that you keep that. Again, keep your results over time. And it, really the only way to do that is um, to have um, a continued pattern of eating. And that's something that we're gonna discuss in this one here. Um, again, if you look at the diets specifically, you know, we're talking about a relatively high protein and low carbohydrate diet. That's actually very important. And I mentioned this before, the average American eats way too much carbohydrates. Um, we used to eat a lot less. You look back at the early 1900s, um, there was significantly less carbohydrate intake and we also had healthier fats. All right, so point number one, 
implement intermittent fasting, or we can also call it time-restrictive eating. And that's something that sounds horrible and difficult, but really isn't. Um, the intermittent fasting, as you see here, daily. Now, there are some studies that will show, well, you can do intermittent fasting two times a week for 20 hours or three times a week, and might have better results for that. The point is most of the things, if we don't do them on a daily uh, basis, we will probably not do them at all. We will skip, we will make excuses. I think a pattern and a routine that we can do daily is the most successful. That's what I've seen with all of my patients. And while, also please keep in mind, I mean, the studies that are done on certain fasting patterns and all that, it is extremely difficult to rule out other conflicting factors. So while I like seeing studies that show certain results on certain interventions, when it comes to dietary, to eating patterns, to, to foods, it's very difficult to really have a consistency among the group that you're studying and really rule it out. Now, if they've done some studies where they basically had people um, you know, live in close uh, uh, quarters, they couldn't leave, they couldn't eat anywhere else, so they made sure they didn't cheat on their meals. So they were kind of locked up and then they served their meals three times a day. Now, <laughs> as you can think, there might be other factors at, at that point, you know what I mean? I mean, not everybody will like being in this situation. So not so sure, anyway. So we recommend for simplicity to eat all your daily food during an, an eight hour period, right? Followed by a 16 hour fasting window. And then now this can vary a little bit. For some people, 14 hours might be enough. I personally, I fast for about 17 hours every day. And it's just because that works better with my schedule when I have breakfast and all that. And it's not difficult at all. I mean, I got so used to this. I'm not hungry outside of the time when I'm actually eating. An example here, you have your breakfast at 11, then you will have one more meal, and that's very important, at three, and dinner at seven. So that gives you really an eight hour window of eating. In that eight hour, you eat about three meals. The last meal of the day should be carb free, and that is very important. So just protein, fat, and vegetables. And again, this causes your body to get into a fat burning ketogenic state faster than after a carb rich meal. Now remember, you don't have to be ketogenic to follow this, but the last meal of the day, so to speak, is a ketogenic meal because it does not have any carbohydrates. So you will have healthy fats, um, good proteins, fibers, and no carbohydrates. That means no fruit, no pasta, no rice, no, um, you know, nothing that has a uh, carb content of any significance. And the important thing with this is um, when you only eat uh, fats, proteins, and some fiber, it is actually a shortened period before your body is running out of energy and looking for alternate fuels. And that alternate fuel is your body fat. And um, if you eat carbohydrates at night, then that might take a bit longer. It might take 10 hours or 12 hours. You don't really go into this really uh, fasting um, uh, window very easily. So after about six hours on average, your body runs out of energy and your body starts burning body fat for fuel, which is what we want to do. That's the whole idea with the intermittent fasting. Besides that, it triggers autophagy. So you're cleaning the cells out of bad mitochondria, bad other things that shouldn't be there. And you're replacing it with, with healthy uh, organelles. But also besides that, some cells might be completely eaten up because they're malfunctioning and they uh, present a danger. So your body becomes very efficient at uh, clearing out the cells that shouldn't be there, um, the cells that are functional to improve the function of these cells. And all in all, this is a process that is very, very supportive to our health. The 16 hour time, now this is a very average value. Um, if you fast a lot longer, at some point, um, the body might start to break down muscle protein. So there might be some, some muscle wasting, which we don't want to have. Um, it can vary a bit from person to person, but 16 hours seems to be the sweet spot really because when you, um, when you look at studies that have been done, that seems to be the time that has been most successful, most successful for people. There are some benefits to fast beyond 16 hours, that's, that's true, and um, if you can you know, dedicate one day a week, let's say, where you go further, that's actually fine to do. I wouldn't do a lot more on a regular basis, though. So for all practical purposes, an uh, eight-hour eating window followed by a 16-hour fasting window. So point number two, delay or skip breakfast. This ties into 
point number one. You fix a time every day when you have your dinner, let's say 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. If on the weekend you have a day when you go out and you have a heavy dinner later, that's fine. But for, the, for most days of the week, you have a fixed time uh, at which you eat your dinner, after dinner, and again for dinner, remember, no uh, carbohydrates at all, that's very important. Just water after dinner, So uh, and then brush your teeth right after dinner, that's kind of a signal to your brain, hey, I'm done eating for the day. That actually is very successful for most people. Then in the morning when you get up, the first thing you do is you start with a big glass of water, about 16 ounces. Now then, remember, you're in a fasting window still right now, you're burning fat. This is actually the time your hormones are optimized early in the morning, you're burning fat, you don't want to disturb that. As soon as I have just even one or two calories in the morning, and they can come from protein, from, from fat, or they can come from, from sugar, then I stop fasting because I briefly spike my insulin, and then it's done. You're not burning fat anymore. That's why stop with a big glass of water, and then your first coffee in the morning should be black, or your espresso, don't put anything in it. Tea, also in any amount, again, no uh, sugar, sweetener, honey, agave, milk, or cream. Very important. Because as you do, it'll just, you know, really kick you out of your fat burning state. And that's really counterproductive. I had to get used to this for many years. I made the mistake of putting creamer in my coffee in the morning. And when I stopped doing that, I had much better results. Made a huge difference. Now remember, you can, when you start your first meal, then you can add in your creamer again. That's not a problem. It's just in this fasting window, you got to keep it clean. So no calories in any shape or form, no matter what it is, don't put anything in your coffee, espresso, or tea that you're drinking in the morning, probably. Anyway, your hormones are optimized in the morning, uh, uh, optimized in the morning, and that's actually an interesting one. So this is a good time to work out because it's deep in your fasted state. And people always think, well, I can't work out in the morning. Yes, that's the perfect time to work out in the morning before you have your first meal. It's actually great, okay? Autophagy, destruction of bad cells or cleaning out of uh, cells, cleaning out metabolic debris, that's actually very important. And that all happens in the state. So you, you don't want to disturb the fasting state. So keep it super clean. So point number three, that's a bit variable, but in general, I would not recommend to snack between meals. So you really have like three relatively large meals. So you don't want to go overboard because again, the goal is uh, fat loss, but you want to have again, healthy proteins, healthy fats, and then you want to really decrease the carbohydrates as much as you can. And always remember, I know I keep saying this, the last meal of the day, your dinner has no carbohydrates at all. That is pretty much a ketogenic meal, right? But the other meals, you can certainly have carbohydrates. Again, the recommendation is on low carb, uh, we recommend between 50 to 100 grams a day. If you are ketogenic, you really have to be under 40 grams a day. And with that comes a few other things that I will discuss in another video. Because, you know, the ketogenic diet, you know, there can be some pitfalls and some problems in it. And I think we need to also then probably follow a few parameters and then also look at cholesterol and how that develops and so on. So there's a, it's a bit more cumbersome. Um, I think many people could benefit from a short period of a ketogenic diet because it really makes you more fat adapted and I'll talk about that in another video too. But for all practical purposes of weight loss, a low carb diet works extremely well. And again, that's between 50 and 100 grams of carbs a day. Do not count calories, you don't have to do that. Use healthy fats, um, don't count fats. But again, maybe you should just see roughly gauge the amount of um, carbohydrates that are coming in. Again, the, you should feel pretty full after each meal, and then you should avoid snacking in between. Um, medications that we give sometimes can help with that. But again, this diet, even when you're not on medication or uh, you know, after you're done with the weight loss, when, when you're off medications, the diet stays the same. So number four is very self-explanatory. Do not any, eat any sugars and refined flours, cookies, uh, cakes, sweets, donuts, of course. That is kind of what I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> we're, reading, we're, we're eating as a Western society way too many um, refined sugars and uh, you know, refined flour. And these things we know are not good for us by any means, okay? And if you have a sweet tooth and you need something sweet in between, I did a video on a um, sweetener um, called allulose. Now, I don't like regular sweeteners, and the reason is for, I mean, when you look at artificial sweeteners, they do massively disrupt uh, your, um, uh, basically, the bacteria in your gut. So, and that's a very important, your, your, your microbiome is crucial in absorbing and processing foods. Now, when we eat sweeteners, we actually, um, you know, like artificial sweeteners, uh, like aspartame and so on, sucralose, then basically what happens is you disrupt the bacteria where you kind of favor the bad bacteria over the good ones. 
and it will lead to um, massively increased absorption of some calories. It's actually very bad for you and also will lead to some GI distress. So artificial sweeteners are, are not good. Allulose can be used, so if you're baking something or if you need to sweeten something, I think allulose is a good option, but keep in mind, um, again, it will still trick your brain into thinking there's some sugar there. And uh, besides the addictive issues with that, uh, again, there, there, there can still be some incident spikes. Even though allulose has kind of shown that it does not do that, I wouldn't trust that completely. I would only use that sparingly as well, and certainly not in your fasting window. And that's very important. Again, fasting windows got to be, got to be super clean. But what's interesting here is actually these reward centers in your brain. They kind of, after a while, I mean, as it is with drug addiction, they kind of um, stop being uh, uh, craving these things, and so you really kind of get over this addiction to sugars by really um, uh, cutting it out. It takes some time, but you're going to feel um, pretty good after a little while, and then you're not going to crave these anymore. So number five, very important, do not drink anything that contains sugars. And this is a big pitfall because many people have these uh, smoothies and they are made with um, some vegetables and a lot of fruit. And fruit, fructose, is probably the worst sugar you can eat, unfortunately. Uh, fructose, and it's a bit complicated, does get absorbed a bit differently and behaves differently in our cells than uh, table sugar, so, so sucrose. Fructose is, for all practical purposes, to simplify it, pretty much goes straight to straight to fat. So we deposit it and that's really horrible for us. Um, so fructose needs to be avoided. Uh, fruit should only be consumed in moderation. And the problem are these drinks and these smoothies. You don't know how much fruit is in there. There may be three, four apples in there or banana and whatnot. And you know, you really shouldn't have those. So don't drink anything that contains sugars. I mean, no water is ideal, but specifically also no, no sodas, even if it's diet sodas. They have a lot of junk in there, a lot of chemicals that are really, really hindering the weight loss. Not good. Fruit juices, absolutely not. These are horrible because again, high fructose. Now the uh, fruit has some vitamins, minerals, there's no question about that, um, but you don't need that much of it. And again, one uh, uh, or two pieces of fruit a day, I always recommend blueberries and raspberries and, and blackberries. Those are lower on the glycemic uh, index, but the other fruit in terms of weight loss and fat loss specifically are terrible for you. No sugar in your coffee. Okay, again, if you need after your fasting uh, uh, window, with, with, after your first meal or with your first meal, you can put a bit of allulose in your coffee and that's fine. And that's okay. Again, moderation is fine. I wouldn't really do too much of that because it will set you up for craving these later, right? The, um, yeah, un unfortunately, the, the diet sodas are loaded with these acids and other chemicals, and that's just terrible. And it really, really hinders the weight loss tremendously. Here, I talked about stevia, but again, I would even say um, allulose is better. So maybe that's something that um, um, allulose is probably the better sweetener, better than stevia. Uh, again, in moderation, that as well, right? to sweeten uh, coffee, tea, um, but again, nothing in the past fasting period. That's hugely important. Number six, that's a very general recommendation. Drink a lot of water. And again, first thing in the morning when you wake up, big glass of water, that's important to start. And then after your coffee, maybe have another glass of water. So you get most of your water probably in the morning. If you drink too much at night and you're up all night, that's not good either. About eight glasses a day, 64 ounces. Um, again, full glass before each meal and snack that actually helps you control how much you eat. So right before you eat your food, have a big glass of water first, okay? It could even be 12 ounces. Have that water in a restaurant. We always get these ice waters, you know, absolutely uh, very beneficial to hydrate before you eat because you will eat less. It will keep you full, okay? Um, makes you less hungry, you know. It can actually boost metabolic rates. Um, but also in terms of bowel regularity, because when you think about it, if we don't drink enough water, again, you know, the um, bowel content gets uh, too dehydrated and then constipation can help a lot, okay? So water is hugely important, we know that, and that's, a, that's an easy one. You just gotta be mindful. I would do most of the drinking in, in the morning and then definitely drink a big glass before your meals. Number seven, exercise. Yes, um, about on average 30 minutes daily. Now, um, Again, I like the idea of having a, a daily pattern because if you're saying, well, I'm doing two, three times a week, I'm going to the gym or I'm doing Pilates or I'm doing weightlifting. Yes, that's great. And I would still encourage you to try to commit a certain time window every day. And ideally it is in the morning uh, while you're in your fasted state. That was so hard for me to understand. And when I implemented that, when I, because I always thought I cannot work out until I had something to eat. And that's not true. And it's actually the best time to work out when you're in deep in your fasted state. 
your hormones are optimized, you will have the best results, you have this mental sharpness, it's actually a great time to exercise. And most people can easier make the time in the morning, you know. You can do it right after you get up, before you even take a shower, you do your exercises. Um, I think that's an important uh, time to do it and it makes a huge difference. Um, ideally, resistance exercises are, um, should be implemented because as you build muscle, you basically, uh, it basically helps you to burn fat easier because muscle is metabolically very active tissue. But you can also just do some walking. Walking has been very effective in uh, fat loss. Um, stairs, if you want to make it a bit more you know, strenuous on, on your muscles. Running, of course, weight training. I think this is a very important one and most people should try to implement a little of this. Swimming, or again, whatever limitations you might have. Swimming is always good if you have joint uh, issues. Treadmill, stair muscle, elliptical, of course, all good. You know, Again, muscle tissue is metabolically very active and burns calories and fat even at rest. So your resting metabolism increases the more lean muscle you have. So again, I always recommend some resistance training. It's a very important thing to do. The last point, yeah, that's always a difficult one. Minimize alcoholic beverages. I used to have, and I'll be honest with you, probably um, like one drink, like a beer or something else every night or with dinner, a glass of wine. And that was hugely problematic. That's when I had um, a lot of fat gain, you know, felt very sluggish, didn't feel very good. And I've really decreased that. It doesn't mean I don't drink alcohol at all, but I drink it now only on, on, on weekends pretty much. Like on a Friday night, I have a drink. Since I'm more following a ketogenic diet, um, not always, but um, for the most part, I would drink a shot of hard liquor and mix it with water and ice um, that doesn't have um, you know, any carbohydrates. It still has calories, but it doesn't have any carbs. I, for all practical purposes, as a physician, I recommend don't drink at all. Drinking is bad for you, but we have to be re realistic. I mean, people will drink on and off. I just think in terms of your weight loss, it is a problem if you drink alcohol every day. It's a big issue. Um, of course, if you take medications, it makes it even worse. Besides the, the calories, really, the carbs vary. Again, hard liquors don't really have carbs, but they certainly have calories. Uh, it also, um, you know, kind of lets you go into your fasting window a bit later. It's not good for that, obviously. And also, it will certainly disrupt your fasting. If you have dinner, let's say, at 7, you have a drink at 9, it kicks you out of your um, fasting. It kicks you out of your fat-burning window and delays that significantly. Um, yeah, and then you have some poor decisions after you drink alcohol. It's like, oh, maybe now I'm, I'm going to eat something. So again, I would really try to minimize it. Uh, alcohol, of course, is just not, not helpful. But realistically, if you socially drink uh, one or two drinks a week, I think that's absolutely fine. Because again, if we can't sustain this, if we can, if we can sustain the way of this eating pattern, then we won't do it long term. So to summarize again, um, the important steps are to decrease carbohydrate intake. We want to get the carbs down to about 50 to 100 grams a day. It also means cutting out all these processed foods. I mean, these are horrible. Again, they carry also these uh, um, vegetable oils with them, which you really don't want to eat. This stuff is just really hindering weight loss and it's making you sick. There's no other way to say that, right? And you want to eat healthy fats, of course. You want to cut out all the bad fats. You eat, eat healthy proteins, you know. And again, it's okay to eat meats, but if you're vegetarian or vegan, that's fine as well, of course, you know. Just eat foods that are not processed, not prepackaged, not sitting in plastic and all these kind of things. Make it fresh, right? And then super important, last meal of the day, the dinner, it has to be a set time, right? Um, except maybe one day a week on the weekend when we go out. And also should not have any carbohydrates in it. That is super important. Again, this helps us at night to burn a lot more fat. And it's actually a tremendous difference, right? Uh, pitfalls are, of course, fruit smoothies, uh, fruit, you know, fruit juices, uh, all these things. I mean, fruit in general is just carrying a lot of sugar. And again, the fruits you can eat, you can have some, some blueberries, you can have some raspberries, blackberries, those are, those are fine, you know, in moderation, like a half a cup a day, but don't go overboard. You don't need more than that, right? Um, and the real high sugar fruits, I would just leave off. For all practical purposes of losing weight, we want to decrease the intake of fructose and it's hidden everywhere. So it's one thing we got to really remember. So, you know, and following this, um, I think you'll be very successful. Again, for some people, I'm tweaking this. So when I'm interacting with a patient one-on-one, -on -one, of course, we're going through certain uh, patterns or it might not fit in their day or people have weird shifts in which they work and so on. These can be addressed. But as a general guideline, this is if you follow these steps we just discussed, you're going to be very successful and you're going to become a lot healthier.